Welcome to the AI Policy Podcast, a podcast by the Wadwani Center for AI and Advanced Technologies at CSIS. I'm Gregory C. Allen. And I'm Andrew Schwartz. Join us as we dive into the world of AI policy, where we'll discuss the implications of this transformative technology for national security, geopolitics, and global governance. Welcome back to the AI Policy Podcast. I'm your host, Gregory Allen of the Wadwani Center for AI and Advanced Technologies at CSIS. Andrew Schwartz, my normal co-host, is on vacation for spring break this week. So we're joined by Brielle Hill, who is the Associate Director of the Wadwani Center. Brielle, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm a longtime listener, first time caller to this podcast, um, and really excited to be talking about uh, what we're following on our team but starting out with some exciting announcements. That yes, got. yes, we've got some good stuff. We're, what do we got? We're growing, we're hiring. Mm -hmm. So what are the positions we're looking for? So we are now coming up on eight people who work at the Wadwani Center, along with 11 non-resident fellows and senior fellows. And we're looking to staff up in the fellow and senior fellow full-time gig. And there's really two areas that we're looking to hire. The first is around AI governance and regulation, one of the hottest topics in DC and around the world on AI policy and something that we're actually gonna be talking about today. And the other one is around AI and national security, thinking about the military implications of AI and the way that militaries and intelligence organizations are using AI to strengthen U.S. national security in a pretty tough geopolitical environment. So if there's anyone out there who is loving this podcast and thinks they want to be a part of doing the research and the convenings that go into it and everything else we do here at CSIS, please apply. I'm really excited to see who is going to apply to those positions, see who we, we can bring on to our team. Um, one of the things that they'll get to do is be a part of the exciting events that we have here at CSIS and at the Wadwani Center. Um, by the way, we just had three incredible events over the past couple of weeks, starting with the Dar DARPA perspectives on AI and autonomy at the DOD, which was this week. Yeah, we've had uh, a pretty incredible run over just the past 10 days. Three events that brought together many of the leaders in the United States government who are working the day-to-day -day aspects of AI, national security, AI governance. Just yesterday, we had Dr. Matt Turek, who's the deputy director of the Information Innovation Office at DARPA and is the leader of so much of the really fascinating AI research that DARPA has underway. I thought it was an incredible conversation. Um, he's one of the brightest minds in the entire world on this topic, not just an incredibly insightful observer of what's going on in AI technology, but really an actor who's, who's creating research communities, driving research communities, and doing it in support of U.S. national security. He's a really cool guy. That event complemented an event we had earlier this week with Captain Lugo and Colonel Strohmeyer. Yeah, these are two of the leaders at the Office of the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Officer at the Department of Defense. So whereas DARPA is really leading the way on research and development, advancing the state of the art of AI technology, CDAO, that organization is really charged with accelerating the adoption of AI in the DOD as it already exists in sort of the commercial industry perspective. And they came on to talk about the exercises that they're running with operational warfighting units to sort of play around and experiment with AI technologies, and also some of the tools that they're developing to make it easier for folks around the DOD and the defense industrial base to actually get their AI technologies in the hands of warfighters. It was a really great conversation. Yeah, I enjoyed listening to it. I learned a lot from that conversation. What I also learned is that CSIS is a good tool to talk about what the government's up to, what they're looking to source from the broader community. Um, and we had last week surveying the future of U.S. open foundational model policy. What was that event? So that event was around the intersection of AI and open source technology. So open source has been a really important part of the development of the internet and the development of so many different technologies. And as the name would imply, it's around sort of openness and creating to freely shared technological tools. It's at the heart of much of what's going on in the internet. In the AI domain, though, it's a bit of a controversial topic because so many AI technologies, as we discuss here on this podcast, have implications for national security. And normally, the United States is not in the business of giving away national security technologies uh, away for free. 
And so that debate is playing out right now in the halls of power and in the United States government and in the AI community. And so the NTIA, the National Telecommunications Information Administration, another doozy of an acronym uh, that you get when you when you work in the AI policy field, they actually have a request for comment out that is asking for perspectives on this topic. You know, what folks think about the benefits of open source technology versus the challenges that it might pose for the security domain in AI specifically. And we brought together folks from the State Department, folks who were recently working at the White House National Security Council, folks are a part of this AI open research community and the NTIA folks leading this in general for, you know, for a conversation about that request for comment. It's going to culminate in a policy recommendation that will go all the way to President Biden and could have a really critical impact on the future of open source technology and AI in particular. So if anybody missed that event, definitely tune in. There was a ton of really interesting conversation. Yeah. And, uh, and on that note, every single event that we do that's public lives on the CSIS website. So our listeners can go and check that out at any point. They can also check out a new report that we released on the G7 Hiroshima AI process. You just got back from Italy, actually, Trento for the digital ministerial meeting. What happened in Trento? Yeah, so the, the G7, the group of seven, is one of the most important international governmental bodies right now. Um, the G20 has really been challenged as an institution following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And because the G20 is really aligned by shared economic interests, the G7, by contrast, is aligned by shared values and shared strategic interests. And that includes conversations around AI, where the G7 has emerged as kind of an unusually important body um, in shaping the future of global AI governance cooperation. So last year, there was the Hiroshima AI process under the Japanese presidency. Folks who've been listening to this podcast will, will know that we think a lot about that process. And, and how important it has been to advancing global AI governance. Well, that work is continuing this year under the Italian G7 presidency. And so the digital industry and technology ministerial meeting uh, just happened uh, earlier this month in March, March 14th and 15th. I had the privilege of going to Trento, Italy, which is like a little ski town in the north of Italy. It's a lovely place for a conference, very beautiful, very scenic, and very relaxing. Except, you know, that we're actually talking about very substantive AI policy issues while we're there. And there were a few things that stood out to me in, in what came out as the ministerial declaration. There were a few topics that were covered, the first of which was public sector use of AI. So this is when governments are using AI to deliver services that really matter to people's privacy or that really matter to their livelihoods. Think about, you know, the use of AI in tax records, the use of AI in delivering homeland security services. Services, you know, they're they're talking about what are the best practices and guidelines that your own governments as G7 members are currently working on and, you know, sharing those best practices externally. The OMB, Office of Management of, and Budget, here in Washington has been doing a, a ton of that kind of work. Probably of more interest to, to more of the folks who are listening to this podcast, though, will be around AI regulation in general. Uh, for example, the EU AI Act. So there are many different work streams happening in the international governance conversation. You just mentioned the EU AI Act. AI Act. We are also, as you mentioned, following the Hiroshima AI process, particularly the Code of Conduct. Mm -hmm. How do these two play together or do they play together? Yeah. So, you know, to begin with, AI regulation is really focused on sort of different technological eras of AI at the same time. You know, machine learning has been a big deal in technology circles since at least 2012 and arguably earlier than that. Uh, more recently, you know, with 2022, we've had the generative AI revolution embodied by applications such as ChatGPT. But there's also this frontier uh, degree of AI, of what we might be dealing with in terms of AI systems five years from now, 10 years from now, that might not just be considerably more capable, they might be 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more capable than we have. And what's interesting is that regulators are already thinking about these frontier AI systems with the full encouragement of the AI research community. And one of the ways in which that has played out is this thing called the Hiroshima AI Process Code of Conduct. 
this document in many ways, you know, bears resemblance to the White House Code of Conduct on Frontier AI models that came back in 2023. And now that those two documents so far have been voluntary, what's interesting is that the EU AI Act now has a mechanism for those types of regulations to be mandatory. So whereas the Hiroshima AI process calls it a code of conduct, the EU AI Act calls for something called a code of practice. And this is something that will apply to in the EU AI Act jargon, general purpose AI systems that pose systemic risk, which as a you know practical matter is going to include you know anything bigger than GPT-4, anything bigger than Claude 3, and potentially even those systems as they exist right now. So these are real regulatory requirements that apply to the most important generative AI models, but as with so much of the EU AI Act, it isn't written yet. So that to me poses some concern because the regulations process can be quite lengthy. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking in terms of maturity for this or or how are how poised are they to actually move forward on this? Yeah, so the EU AI Act in many ways is po is, is positioned as an IOU for regulation. So it's it's frequently described including by European Union officials as the most mature, the sort of first mover in global AI regulation. Um, in practice, however, as I said, it's an IOU for regulation because most of the EU AI Act says thou shalt follow the standard and those standards haven't been developed yet. And this is exactly the case with the code of practice stipulation for general purpose AI systems such as you know, GPT-4 by OpenAI. Well, the deadline to come up with this code of practice is uh, around January 2025, according to the sort of original stipulations and, and provisions in the EU AI Act. And the most mature code of conduct or code of practice that's sort of available anywhere is the one that the Hiroshima AI process drafted last year as part of the G7. And so one of the things that the folks at the G7 are thinking about is how do they mature this uh, Hiroshima AI code of conduct into something that could actually serve as a baseline for AI governance worldwide. And you know, some governments are going to make that mandatory, such as the, the European Union, it seems likely to do. Other governments might make that more on a voluntary basis or only mandatory under certain conditions. But I think what is so interesting is that this is a conversation that's being had internationally. If you think about you know, GDPR, much of the EU approach in that was, this is our regulation, take it or leave it. And by contrast, this time around, there's a much more global engagement on the conversation. And so far, a lot of that conversation is taking place at the G7. I think in the future, more of that conversation might move to a larger body, the OECD. So there's an opportunity here, you're saying, to potentially mature the Hiroshima AI process code of conduct to meet the presumption of conformity within the EU AI Act by January 2025. That's a big lift. It's you're a, right. It's you're a big right. lift. I think, I think it's, there's a chance. And I would further say that I think it's worth these governments working together with this kind of goal in mind, because even if they fall short, what they will achieve in the course of trying to do that is make a lot of progress towards another G7 goal for AI governance, which is interoperability. And interoperability really gets to a goal that's different from harmonization. Harmonization is where we have the exact same regulations. For example, when I was in Italy, I rented a car. I just took out my Virginia driver's license, handed it to the car rental place in Italy, and they accepted that. And that's because the regulations for you know driver's tests are so close between the United States and the European Union that they're willing to accept our standard as qualifications under their regulations. That's regulatory harmonization. In AI, that's going to be a really, really big lift. It's going to take a long time. A more near-term achievable goal, though, is what we call interoperability. And that is, can we have similar definitions that underpin you know, what constitutes accuracy, what constitutes robustness? And can we also have similar yardsticks for how we measure those types of things? And when you have regulatory interoperability, you do a lot to decrease barriers you know, between the United States and our very close allies 
on things like research collaboration or on things like trade. And so I think interoperability is a really important goal. It's one that the G7, to its credit, has had at the core of its collaborative work in AI governance. And I think that this code of practice, code of conduct discussion is really the right place to be focusing on sort of the next round of interoperability work. Yeah, and from our conversations, and particularly when we went to uh, Brussels and Rome earlier this year. It was a great trip. It was a great trip. Um, and everyone seems to get it. They mm-hmm. seem to understand this concept on paper. In practice, or moving it forward seems to be where the Italians are energized to keep it moving forward. Maybe mm-hmm. they don't have the capacity within their country to yeah, do it they, themselves. They can't do it all by themselves. They're, they're going to need help. And I think that, to their credit, right, they've really taken on the mantle of shepherding this international dialogue process. And so, you know, while uh, Italy does not have enough AI experts on staff, basically no government on earth has as many AI experts on staff as they need, you know, you can get more done uh, when you work together, even though diplomacy is hard. Yeah. So what's the immediate next step for the code, the code of conduct, the Hiroshima AI process to mature it to that level? Well, I think the the code of conduct as it exists right now is a really strong set of commitments that companies or AI research organizations can sign up to and say, if we're in the business of making really powerful general purpose AI systems, these are the kinds of practices that, that we're going to adhere to. The challenge is that those practices are not specified to a degree that would meet the needs of a regulation such as the EU AI Act. And let's not forget that the EU AI Act on the other side of those regulations can include some pretty stiff penalties, right? For, for some violations of the EU AI Act, a company can be fined 6% of global revenue, not profit, revenue. And 6%? Six, yeah, 6%. And that's a really, really hefty bill for some of these global tech giants. So for a company to sign up to something like a code of conduct or a code of practice, knowing that on the other side of that could be some really stiff legal penalties and fines, they're going to need clarity. And the code of conduct as it exists in the Hiroshima AI code of conduct is really does not have the degree of clarity that a corporate general counsel is going to feel comfortable signing up to this. But that's not really a criticism because the Hiroshima AI process is closer than any other document on earth at this point to meeting those needs. So it's sort of the, in my view anyway, the the logical starting point. So if I'm a company, I'm probably not ready to put my signature on this document Mm -hmm. at this point. But am I participating in this? Am I encouraged by this? Yeah, I mean, in our in our dialogues here at the Wadwani Center with AI companies, they definitely want to be a part of this conversation. They definitely want to see, you know, what can be done to to mature this document, the the code of conduct. Um, That's not to say that, you know, success is guaranteed. As I said before, January 2025 is a really tight timeline. But, you know, what's the alternative? The alternative is that the European Commission, you know, writes something by themselves. And that would be, of course, in consultation with the companies. But I think that's going to be a better conversation if the United States government is part of the conversation, if the Japanese government is part of the conversation, UK, Canada, the other G7 members, um, and even the other OECD members. So, I think it's actually to the European Union's credit that there are some uh, folks in the European Commission who are interested in what's going on with the Hiroshima AI Code of Conduct, are interested in whether that could serve as the template for a EU AI Act Code of Practice. Um, Again, January 2025 is very soon. These documents take a long time to write. Success is not guaranteed, but I was really encouraged coming out of Trento that, that people are interested in trying. So you've mentioned the OECD a couple of times. How are they potentially going to be involved in this process moving forward? Mm-hmm. So one of the things that you need when you have something like this code of practice, this code of conduct, is monitoring, right? How are companies going to know and show that they are complying with those kinds of requirements? And by the same token, how are governments going to know and show that companies are complying? So that monitoring mechanism is actually something that the OECD is involved with in other types of international regulatory processes. 
The OECD has a history of being involved in monitoring other types of international agreements that do have regulatory force, and so there's some optimism that they could do this. It also helps that the Japanese government is chairing the MCM of the OECD this year, and that gives them the opportunity to continue their work under the Hiroshima AI Code of Conduct. And in recent conversations, I've been encouraged to hear that the G7 uh, has a history of working with the OECD in this way previously. Mm -hmm. I've also heard GPAY thrown around a couple of times. What is GPAY? Yeah, GPAY is the Global Partnership on AI, and it was originally created sort of with the idea of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's a intergovernmental body that brings together conversations around climate change, convenes cooperative research on climate change. And it was sort of seen as a model for allowing evidence to enter the conversation around AI. This was a few years ago at this point. And so GPAY, the Global Partnership on AI, sort of had that model in mind to bring together researchers who could conduct research that would support governmental decision making around AI governance. Well, that body is now housed at the OECD, even though its membership includes more than just the OECD. So that means there's thinking out loud here. None of this is set in stone. But, you know, the nice thing about the G7 is that it's a small group of close friends. And when you have a small group of close friends who all have, you know, a good amount of government capacity, you can get a lot of stuff done fast. Um, however, AI governance ultimately needs to be larger than, than just the G7 countries, if any of this is, is really going to work. And so, you know, one path for that kind of enlargement would be the OECD and then GPAY, which includes, you know, India, for example, and, and many other countries who would be really nice if they were sort of part of this, this AI governance conversation. So in, in all of this, you know, EU AI Act, Hiroshima AI Process Code of Conduct, potentially being absorbed into the, the EO AI Act in the form of code of practice, mm -hmm. working with the OECD um, and GPAY to help mature that code. Mm -hmm. Taking a step back, the EU AI Act is obviously precedent setting. Mm -hmm. It is the first of its kind comprehensive legislation being moved through. Yep. But the Brussels effect is a very well supported phenomenon. And I wanted to get a sense from you how you anticipate the EUAI Act influencing other key pieces of legislation we see emerging internationally um, or, or domestically. The White House executive order is something we talk about on this podcast, but also as a team. The African Union is putting together some of their own guidelines. Do you see the EUAI Act actually acting as another Brussels effect story? Yeah, and I, th I think that's a great question. And it's worth remembering that the sort of original coining of, of the Brussels effect was around, among other things, GDPR, the, the EU's landmark privacy legislation. And if you look in the regulatory code of many countries in, for example, Africa, there are large blocks of the EU AI Act that are just copy pasted with the, you know, the names of the regulatory body changes into the regulations of many African countries. So and, and countries, you know, outside of Europe, outside of Africa as well. So GDPR was a really influential piece of digital technology regulation. And there wasn't, a, you know, a massive effort to make that international. You know, the EU did what they thought would work for their own policy goals. It just happened to be the case that it served as a template for a lot of other countries. I think to the EU's credit, when it comes to the AI Act, there's a lot more deliberate effort around international consultation, you know, through what's already happening in, in the G7 and through, I think, also outreach to, to other countries in, for example, the, the global south. And I think this is all pretty encouraging. There's a ton of really hard work to do. There's only so many people who have the, the required skill sets, but it could be a really big year for, for global AI governance. Well, certainly something we'll continue to watch. Hopefully our new AI governance fellow will get... Yeah, come help, please. <laughs> come help out. We have a lot to keep track of with this. I do want to move domestically and talk about TikTok. Yep. So on March 13th, the House of Representatives voted overwhelmingly to pass a bill that would potentially ban TikTok from app stores if ByteDance, which is TikTok's owner, does not divest ownership from the app. Before we dive into how we got here, where this could potentially go, and if it's actually a risk that uh, TikTok will be removed from U.S. app stores, I want to 
hear from you. What makes TikTok an AI story? This is worth keeping in mind that TikTok is often described as a social media platform, but one of the reasons why it's so interesting in technology circles is that it's a sort of an AI first social media company. If you think about, for example, Facebook or Instagram and historically, you know, how sharing worked on those platforms, Twitter is another example, it was really driven by your social network, who you had followed on the platform, who you had friended on the platform, that was really determining what types of content you were going to see is what types of content your friends had also liked. TikTok sort of did away with that model and went much more deeper into the AI and machine learning based recommendation engines that was not based on your social connections, but just based on what types of content you had watched and what other people like you, based on the data that TikTok had collected about you, liked. So it was a really big move in the direction of AI. It's actually why the TikTok algorithm is much more computationally expensive to run than the, the Facebook algorithm had historically been. One of the many reasons why Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg you know, recently announced that his company was purchasing 350,000 GPUs to do all of this incredible AI computational loads that they're going to be working on. Part of that is to, is to look a little bit more like TikTok. So you're saying when I'm on Facebook, um, it's learning about my ecosystem or giving me an algorithmic recommendation based on what my friends are engaging with as well as what I'm engaging with. TikTok is learning about me as an individual and what I might be interested in. Based on what other people like you have previously liked. Yeah, and, and the Facebook and Instagram and Twitter have all declared that they're headed more in the direction of TikTok more recently because TikTok's making a ton of money and it's attracting a ton of attention. Um, and those are all things that those companies want. So it really was sort of a pioneer in um, a new AI-driven social media era. When this legislation sort of made the 24-hour news cycle, this, this potential ban of TikTok, I kind of rolled my eyes because I've heard this story before, yeah. or so I thought. This story kind of begins in 2020, but the tone feels different this time around. It has gone past the 24-hour news cycle. We're still talking about it right now from March 13th. So what is the key difference on this attempt to ban TikTok in the US? I think there's a, there's a big difference in a few ways. Number one, the last time folks were talking about banning TikTok, a lot of the momentum was emerging from the White House during the Donald Trump White House. And Donald Trump had previously proposed, you know, banning TikTok via executive agency functions. But this time it's coming out of Congress. Uh, the House has already passed a bill that would force divestiture of TikTok, and it was passed in a major bipartisan majority. The vote was 352 to 65. And in the current, That's in the bipartisan. current, yeah, in the current U.S. political era, not a ton of bills passed 352 to 65. It was actually quite remarkable that this took place, and. I've heard, you know, in talking with members of Congress and in talking with folks who work on their staff, that a briefing by the U.S. intelligence community was quite influential in moving the votes uh, of a lot of folks. They, they learned stuff that they found to be compelling evidence of a national security threat by the Chinese ownership and control via the Co Chinese Communist Party of the TikTok social media platform. So is that the top concern of lawmakers, that it is a national security threat? Or is it more of the, the social implications of having TikTok in the US with its AI algorithm? So there's been folks who have expressed concerns about TikTok, about what it does to mental health, about what it does to you know teen development, that kind of thing. That's really not the story here. The story really is a national security concern about control of TikTok by indirectly the, the Chinese Communist Party. So just to give you a sense of like why TikTok is important in this story, first, you know, research by Pew has pointed out that about a third of US adults under the age of 30 are regularly getting their news from TikTok. That's a big deal, right? When you have so much of the, the US public getting their news from this platform. And what does TikTok do with that power? What do they do? Well, according to the Network Contagion Research Institute in partnership with Rutgers University, they were looking at how TikTok posts compare to Instagram posts. Obviously, they're both big social media platforms. Um, they're both targeting you know, a, a, a very large, very global audience. And when it comes to stuff like popular culture, 
the media that's on Instagram and the media that's on TikTok is about 45% identical. So they're both watching a ton of the same stuff. Even in politics, it's not quite 40% identical. So a lot of the same stuff on TikTok, on um, Instagram. But what happens when it's political items that are sensitive to the goals of the Chinese Communist Party. Stuff like pro-Ukraine content, stuff like about the Uyghur repression, stuff about Taiwan, stuff about Tibet, Tiananmen, Hong Kong. On those types of issues, the correlation between what's on TikTok and what's on Instagram can be under 10%, sometimes as low as 1%. And to me, this is pretty interesting evidence, right? of the folks who govern the TikTok platform sort of putting their thumb on the scale for what types of content shows up in TikTok news feeds. To give you just you know one other anecdote that, that comes to mind, NBA content was really popular on TikTok. A lot of people like to watch fun dunks or fun, fun three-point shots. And the Houston Rockets, because they brought on Yao Ming, uh, had historically been extremely popular as an NBA team in the Chinese media market. Well, when Daryl Morey, very famously during the big Hong Kong protests a few years ago, said that he supported a free Hong Kong, suddenly all the content for the Houston Rockets disappeared from the TikTok platform, even though you could go find other NBA teams. And so the evidence of, of TikTok actually governing what's on the platform in line with the political goals of the, the Chinese Communist Party is pretty strong. So I want to go a little bit further on the national security implications if ByteDance retains ownership. Um, this algorithmic bias, sort of Chinese being able to put their thumb on the scale, so to speak, may include election concerns. Mm -hmm. What are you tracking in that regard and, and dis disinformation? In this, I think the, the lobbyists and, and the people who support TikTok have kind of done themselves a disservice because the company actually sent out a message to all TikTok users in the United States directing them to call their congressmen and say that they should vote against this bill. And for the men and women of the United States Congress who got who heard about this and received all these phone calls, they said, oh, my gosh, you know, TikTok is a political juggernaut and they are willing to exercise that power. You know, what if they did that um, on, you know, not just an issue about forcing a divestiture of TikTok to U.S. ownership, but if they did that on something else, like whether or not to support Ukraine, like whether or not to support Taiwan, um, that could be a really big and powerful push in the U.S. political discourse. And they didn't feel comfortable, basically, knowing that, that TikTok was willing and able to ex exercise that kind of power. So that exercise did not help China. Oh, no, no. I mean, I've, I've heard it out of the mouths of people of Congress who said, wow, that really made us extremely uncomfortable to get all those those phone calls. Um, kind of a forced error on the part of the, the TikTok lobbying community. I think there's a, one other thing that I really want to raise here, which is the words of TikTok and, and I should say ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok's founder back in 2018, when ByteDance was facing criticism from Chinese regulatory authorities. And he put a post on WeChat, another very popular Chinese social media platform. And, and I think this document, it's just worth reading some of these quotes at length because they are so remarkable. You don't really see stuff like this in, in US politics very often. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so he, here's, here's some of the quotes from the, the letter that he, he published. Quote, I earnestly apologize to regulatory authorities and to our users and colleagues. Since receiving the notice yesterday from regulatory authorities, I have been filled with remorse and guilt, entirely unable to sleep. I am responsible because I have failed to live up to the guidance and expectations supervisory organs have demanded all along. And then it goes on. I profoundly reflect on the fact that a deep level cause of the recent problems in my company is a weak understanding and implementation of the four consciousnesses. These are things that uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese Communist Party uh, general secretary, has been putting out as ideological guidance. Mm. And then it goes on. Deficiencies in education on the socialist core values and deviation from public opinion guidance. Public opinion guidance meaning what the Chinese censorship uh, organizations tell people to publish. All along, we have placed excessive emphasis on the role of technology, and we have not acknowledged that technology must be led by the socialist core value system, broadcasting positive energy, suiting the demands of the era, and respecting common convention. And then he further goes on to say, you know, how ByteDance is going to change, and they're going to change by 
further deepening cooperation with authoritative, meaning official communist party, media, elevating distribution of authoritative media content, and ensuring that authoritative media voices are broadcast to strength. I think those are extremely concerning statements. And who are they coming from? They're coming from the founder and CEO of Bike Dance. Um, so this is the kind of thing that I think folks are in Congress are very much keeping in mind. And I want to point out that in other media domains, you know, such as, you know, owning TV stations or owning newspapers in the United States, there oftentimes are requirements that those things be owned uh, by U.S. citizens. That's why Rupert Murdoch, the chairman of News Corp, which owns Fox News, he was originally an Australian citizen. Now he's an American citizen. So this is not sort of an unprecedented thing, but it is new for the social media era. Yeah, the CEO essentially is saying, sorry, I was not a good enough soldier of the Chinese Communist Party. Kind of, yeah. And that, that was back in 2018. Uh, and I think they've noticed that their words are monitored by you know folks like myself, folks like the, the China Media Project, with the, which did the translation of that WeChat post. Mm -hmm. And so now they're playing a little bit more to two regulatory audiences. But if I was a US regulator, I would be very concerned. Sure. And, and this one, it seems like really has momentum. It already passed by a huge majority in the House. The Senate is getting that same uh, intelligence community briefing on TikTok. May have already happened, actually. Um, and so we'll see where it goes from here. Sure. And I, I'm sure that China is not happy about this momentum. What, if anything, can they do at this point to move it in their direction? Well, there's there's plenty of things that the, the Chinese Communist Party can do that would hurt U.S. companies. That's that's always available to them. But there's actually not a symmetric retaliation. And that's because Facebook and Instagram and Twitter are already banned in China. They have been banned for over a decade in China. So there's no really reciprocal uh, retaliation, but there's plenty of other sort of asymmetric retaliations they could go for. So on the U.S. side, particu particularly in the Senate, it feels like a harder read to, to look at the makeup of the Senate and know where they're going to land on this mm -hmm. topic. Yeah, you know, Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer has sort of said that he's really waiting to hear what the the chairs of the Senate Intelligence Co Committee tell him, um, which I think is you know classically good leadership from from a majority leader who's sort of trying to defer to some of the experts on this topic in his own caucus, and but also to the other party um, in the intelligence community. Particularly because he's been leading the effort on AI legislation mm -hmm. here. Um, so I'm yeah, he's very sensitive to the AI and national security nexus. So who is opposing this bill as it stands? Well, ironically, uh, Donald Trump, uh, among others. So Donald Trump, who had been previously, you know, exploring the possibility of banning TikTok while he was the president of the United States. This time around, Donald Trump has publicly sort of said that he would oppose banning TikTok. Now, it's worth mentioning here that he's given himself a little bit of flexibility in that regard because the bill does not purport to ban TikTok. The bill would force a sale of the U.S subsidiary that operates TikTok to a U.S. owned company. So um, it's not officially a ban. It's actually a forced sale. And we'll see where where Donald Trump, you know, sort of finally comes down. Of note, though, uh, around the same time that he made that statement, Jeff Yass, who's a major Republican donor and, ha and owns billions of dollars in shares uh, in, in TikTok, made a $5 million donation to the Trump re-election campaign. So uh, the New York Times and others, you know, sort of raised the question of the degree to which Trump's opposition to the to the bill actually relates to, you know, basically getting a donation from from TikTok related money. Do you think that's a loud minority or is it likely to pass in the Senate? I think this one really has a shot at passing. I certainly wouldn't say that it's guaranteed by any means. There's a lot of lobbyists working on this issue on both sides, but you know, banning TikTok has been part of the policy conversation in Washington, as as you said originally, for you know four plus years at this point, and this is clearly the closest we've ever come to actually doing it. Okay, so let's say it does pass in the Senate. There's a huge election looming where. Mm -hmm. President Biden needs uh, the youth support. Mm -hmm. TikTok, it goes without saying, is very popular in the younger generations. Mm -hmm. What is the likelihood of Biden signing this bill? Well, I, you know, now now you're asking me to uh, project politics, which I'm much weaker at than I am AI <laughs> policy. But 
the bill actually says that there's you know there's this time window of how long that the the divestiture has before it takes place 180 days i believe is is what it says and i do think that that was put in place with the election in mind sort of giving president biden the the flexibility so that he's not banning it you know like the day before the election or or something like that However, he had said previously that if it passed, he would sign it. Um, he's already come out and sort of said that. Um, of course, he could he could walk that back and, and have some kind of reason. But so far, as I said, this is the farthest we've come uh, in, in making a big move on TikTok in many years. And as you reminded us, it, it does not mean that it's signed TikTok's ban end of story. Mm-hmm. Um, I imagine there would be some major blowback, though, if that does happen in in a certain part of of our uh, society. What would this mean for the millions of users around the U.S. if this bill were to go through? Theoretically, not much. You know, the, the fact is that TikTok makes a ton of money right now. Whoever buys TikTok is going to like making a ton of money. And so what they would presumably do is keep TikTok as a fun, exciting social media platform, the the same reason why so many people use it every day right now, uh, among whom I am not one, but nevertheless, that, you know, a lot of people use it now. Um, What it might mean, though, is that their data is significantly safer from collection by Chinese Communist Party affiliated and aligned organizations, um, which gets back to those national security concerns that the intelligence community has. Um, It turns out that, you know, the types of data that TikTok collects um, are pretty useful to, to, to spies, to propagandists, to other communities. And this is something that, that perhaps you know, could be addressed through this sort of forced divestiture. I'm sure it's something that our colleagues in congressional affairs are going to be watching very closely oh, for yeah. us as well. Uh, I want to stay in the U.S. and switch to more technical of a conversation, which is our overstressed power grids. Oh, yeah. I was not... Really covering the full gamut on this episode. We we really are. Um, (laughs) There's a lot to be um, excited about with AI, but there's a lot to be cognizant of as Mm -hmm. well. We have been looking into the overburdened power grids as it's made headlines in the U.S. as as demand for this industrial power grows. Mm -hmm. I become more intrigued with it when Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, posted on X that OpenAI believes the world needs more AI infrastructure, fab capacity, energy, data centers, etc. Then people are currently planning to build, building massive scale AI infrastructure and a resilient supply chain is crucial to economic competitiveness. You know, when Sam Altman says something on X, it's going to be picked up by mm-hmm. the news. Uh, this has stuck around as well. And according to the International Energy Agency, by 2026, data centers alone will consume 6% of total U.S electricity, which would be up from 4% in 2022. I think that's a mind-blowing statistic. Well, well, why is it mind-blowing? Because to me, 6% is like, you know, 6%, but it's data centers alone. So can you walk me through what that actually means? Yeah, so the electricity is not all of U.S. energy use, right? What's on the electrical grid does not cover, for example, you know, the gas that goes in your car or the fuel that goes in a jet airplane. There's more to energy than just electricity. But electricity is a big, big part of the story. And what that uh, International Energy Agency data is saying that in just four years, data centers are going to increase, you know, their own share of electricity consumption by 50% and now constitute 6%. And by the way, the trends that are driving that growth seem to be accelerating, not slowing down. And a lot of the story comes back to AI. AI computation at the current moment is incredibly energy intensive. You know, when when folks at OpenAI or Microsoft or Google or whomever are thinking about building the next big supercomputer to train or operate these large language models, One of the things they're thinking about, and this is not a joke, is what sites have a big enough power plant and what sites have enough power grid capacity to transmit that power to their data center. So these things are really, 
really power hungry. And for some regional grids, you know, in the types of places that tend to be home to a lot of data centers, it's not a four to 6% transition, it might be like a 25 to 50% transition. I don't know the numbers particularly off the top of my head, but Virginia, my own home state at the moment, is a big, big data center player. And the race to build enough energy capacity and energy transmission capacity to build out the types of data centers that the modern AI universe is looking like it's going to need, it's a real challenge. Yeah, I imagine the intersection between the capacity to have a huge center with the capacity to put it on the grid is yeah, I hard mean, to pin down. It's, it's one of the key variables that every AI company is thinking about when they think about where to build a data center. Well, and so how are they thinking about this issue? What are they asking for to move this forward? Well, one of the interesting things is that a lot of the top tech companies, for example, you know, Google has a 100% renewable energy commitment, or maybe it's not 100%, but it's a very high renewable energy commitment. And what they're basically saying is, for all the electricity that their company consumes, they want to purchase an equivalent amount of renewable energy. For so for solar, for wind, you know, Google and Microsoft are big, big buyers of this renewable energy capacity. And that's a really important topic right now because. AI energy usage is growing so rapidly, and the question is, can you know renewable energy grow a as rapidly as required for them to live up to their existing commitments, uh, much less sort of meet the, the demand for this sort of overall ecosystem? So that's why you've seen leaders like Sam Altman, also Elon Musk, sort of talking very publicly about how their goals for AI and the growth of AI capacity and technology, one of the key bottlenecks that they're facing might be energy. One other part of the renewable energy story is that, you know, the many countries, the United States, many countries in Europe, they're trying to go green as countries. And so when companies, you know, have these renewable energy targets, what they find is, you know, a country in Europe might build a lot of renewable energy capacity excited that their country is going to go from, you know, 30% renewable energy to 40% renewable energy. But then actually just a new data center gets built there and it eats you know, all the existing energy. And so the politics of this situation are getting uh, quite complicated. You know, historically, it was the case that the sort of anti-climate change, the, the folks who are, who are pro taking steps to mitigate the effects of climate change and move towards a renewable energy ecosystem, those folks tended to be aligned with the big companies, uh, the big tech companies, because the big tech companies were some very prominent buyers of renewable energy and supporters of renewable energy. In the future, that, that political nexus might change. Um, you're starting to see, even now, some of the, the climate change political actors start to criticize these tech companies and to criticize the energy uses of AI systems. So that's a really complicated issue, one that we're going to continue watching. Well, AI is never easy to kind of pick apart and figure out where it's going necessarily. But it sounds to me like the current rate of AI innovation is going to put an increased demand on energy. Definitely. Definitely. At the same time, we're not growing our capacity at the same rate mm -hmm. to have that energy increase. At the same time, there is a big global conversation about renewable energy, about making more sustainable infrastructure moves. Is this possible? Is this solution something that is going to come about? Or, or where are you concerned uh, this is going? Well, you know, one, one benefit here is that you know, the chips that power AI, you know, in mo for the most part, NVIDIA GPUs in, in most companies, they're extremely power intensive. Um, and what's ironic is that they're getting more power efficient every year, but the total amount of power that they're demanding is continuing to go up even as they get more efficient. Oh. And that's just because the AI opportunity is so attractive that more and more people are building more and more data centers full of more and more of these chips. And it's a, it's a really tough issue because nobody wants to walk away from the incredible productivity and economic benefits that increased adoption of AI offers. But 
you know, the climate change community is sort of saying we can't be giving up on our climate goals. The White House executive order actually put out a request for information that was looking at the intersection of AI and climate change, AI and energy efficiency. And, you know, when the results of that RFI and the government study comes out, I think it's going to be a big conversation starter. So is the U.S. position to make the needed changes to our infrastructure efficiently? I think that remains to be seen. And it's definitely one of the things that we're going to be researching and exploring and, and hopefully making good recommendations on um, at the Wadwani Center over the next year. So my burning question about this is who in the U.S. government is paying attention to this? In some of our conversations, I get the sense that not everyone is quoting the same level of demand. Um, it feels like new issue, although I'm sure it's not a new issue. But who is looking at it? What are they doing to mitigate this problem? Well, I think everybody is, is looking at this issue. All the big AI companies are looking at it. The Department of Energy is looking at it. The White House is looking at it. The relevant committees in Congress are looking at it. Um, I think this issue is not going away. There was a big story in the, in the Washington Post on this topic just a few weeks ago. And I think that's a harbinger uh, of what we can expect to, to come into the conversation over the next few weeks and few months. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We're going to continue to follow these multilateral AI governance efforts, specifically the Hiroshima AI process and as it interacts with the EU AI Act. The conversation in Washington about the stress of advanced AI on our, on our power grids is going to be an evolving story. And then, of course, TikTok is not going to go away from our purview anytime soon. Our listeners can read our recent report, Advancing the Hiroshima AI Process Code of Conduct under the 2024 Italian G7 Presidency Timeline and Recommendation. Rolls right off the tongue. Yeah, no worries. You can find that in our show notes. You can also access the link to our landing page for the Wadwani Center for AI and Advanced Technologies. There you can also find our newsletter. Please subscribe to our newsletter. It, it's a great synthesis of, of everything that the Wadwani Center has been up to over the past month. And then, of course, if you have any questions or suggestions for this podcast, drop us a line at AIPolicyPodcast at CSIS.org. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the AI Policy Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to visit our website, csis.org, for show notes and our research reports. This podcast was produced by David Lotfi, Isaac Goldston, Isabel Burns, and Sadie McCullough. See you next time.